that I was at Guilford, I made this talk for the first time. It had been, uh, I've been trying to make something, I've been trying to capture this idea for a long time, and I finally felt like I, could, I got there at last, just after my thesis. And it was, the, the image I had seen was uh, from a fashion magazine that my girlfriend was doing her thesis in French fashion had, and it was this plate of, um, it was a fashion plate of this woman turning with a long dress on, and that dress flowing like out from her and just off the, just off the surface, just off the floor. And I saw it and I thought, I'm gonna make a teapot that looks like that at some point. And so I kind of worked on it and had a lot of different versions, and this is the one that got the closest to capturing that, and that's at World of the Teapot there. And, um, but it was in that last month and I was working in the studio at Guilford and my teacher stopped by, Lisa Young, and she said, I told her what I was trying to do, and she said, oh, why don't you should flip the pot over and paddle the bottom of it. And this had like never occurred to me. <laughs> and that was what, what, what allowed it, it to work. Now it's up on these three feet and it's really wide, low base. And, um, That it warps quite a bit in the firing. And I kept having problems with the, the lids getting caught. So I finally, so I fired them separately, and then they typically have to like grind them. And you guys you ever use that valve grinding compound, like auto mm -hmm. stuff to, you yeah, to grind like a lid, to smooth the lid while I was like grinding like hours and grind this lid back in. Mm. And then I and then I thought, well, I'll use wadding like in the wood kiln and I'll wad it. And that's actually worked, it's probably the best. And so the least amount of grinding. And I also got a Dremel set with, with uh, diamond tipped Dremel bits. And that's helped quite a bit too. What used to take me an hour to grind, I can do it in like three seconds with a Dremel. You mean from a grinding wheel to a Dremel tool? Well, no, I was using the valve grinding compound, which is just basically oh, like just, liquid yeah. silicon carbide, or like a, a jelly silicon carbide. So in that process though, because I was having so much trouble with the lids fitting, I came up with a uniform. It was the first time I was like, oh, I'm just gonna make a certain size lid, and every time I'm gonna make the lid the same size, I made like a little stick for myself. It's like, all right, this is the size of the lid. And that first one, that first one that I made, I then was out of school, it was 1997. Okay. And Mark Books and Don Davis are putting out a book called like altered, like thrown and altered yeah. pottery. You guys seen that book? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was in the back of Ceramics Monthly. Well, I was like looking for that kind of stuff. And I saw that the ad didn't cost anything to enter images, so I just sent some images in. And luckily, a photo major was helping me take images and he knew how to shoot product. So, he set me up to, to shoot some really good images of pots at, you know, that, after that, before I left Guilford. And, um, and I got a piece in that, in that book. I got a tea, that teapot in that book. And it was like the first thing out of school. And it seemed so easy. And then so I, was, I was applying to shows. And I was like, get a piece into this show, get a piece into that show. I was having it, it just seemed so easy. It's like you just gotta you know, apply. And then something happened and I like, couldn't get a piece in any show. <laughs> For a little while. Alright, so I've got this really wide base. Let's stand this up. I feel like I got too much clay on my floor still. Since this is such a wide floor, I, I don't think about this, but I do it. I just 
I pack it quite a bit, and then sometimes I'll actually even take a rib over it. How many of these do you think you've made so far? Oh, maybe 50, really? maybe. I don't know, not that many. Maybe not even 50. I'm thinking like now, have I made any this year? I have no, I definitely haven't made any this year. See the new year. There's one on the table. That's 2013. Does it really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, mine, that's mine. Maybe made in 12. Did I make some? I'm trying to think if I made some right. Yeah, you didn't date this one. So this is the one you made in 2013. <laughs> That was from 2012. I occasionally, um, I might make three a year. But there's probably years where I didn't, maybe I didn't make any. And I don't make three a year because I have this quota that I've got to make three a year. <laughs> But um, I've gotten interested in other pots for other reasons. And I still, there's something, it's like visiting an old friend to, to go back and make this pot. And um, so I still really like, I like to make them. I never, they, I, I feel like they come out sporadic though. They don't. They're not the kind of pot that I would make, like, you know, three of a cycle. And so, um, there's still things about that first pot that I wish I could capture. Mm -hmm. And then there's ones about, ones that maybe I didn't think were that special, but I photographed and looking back on them, I go like, wow, that was, that had some aspects to it that I wish I could capture. And um, I don't, I don't know if I want to be, I don't like chasing old pots. I don't know if that's a good, good way to spend my time. So I try not to, I try to think about each one new. I'm looking for one of these sticks, but it's bigger than that. Is it under here? Is it under here? Maybe it's still in my container. I started making the lids a little bit larger than I had before. And I know I brought it. See it, so I can just measure for it. I had since I started wadding them, I've had less problems. Do you have? Do you guys have pots that you make? I guess I have pots I make all the time, again and again, but they're not this complicated. It's it's definitely. Out of everything that I've ever made, it is the most like published thing I have. And for that reason, I should probably make it all the time. Do you have a favorite piece that you enjoy making more than anything else? I think if um, there, I like I really love to make teapots, and I, I like the challenge of like the, putting the parts together. Um, But I like, I don't know, I like doing a lot of different things. I think if I was going to just sit down and have to work work on something off of the wheel, teapots would probably be the thing that I would, I could spend time on those <clears throat> and not, um, I don't, I don't sort of think about the amount of time I spend on I don't, I don't consider it. I guess wasteful is not the right word, but I don't mind. I don't mind pouring tons of time into them. Where you'll see me put them together like salt and pepper shakers, and it might take me longer to do that than some of my teapots. Um, and I don't mind doing a couple, but if I have like, if I've made like four sets, and I'm going to spend the afternoon putting together these four sets of salt and pepper shakers, there's something about how small they are, maybe in the, the way I have to like manipulate and work on this very small thing. Maybe it just bothers like my 
my physical self, you know, and my back starts to tighten up or something. <laughs> and uh, I'd much rather be putting together a teapot spending that time doing that. But I love to throw, I love to throw bowls and platters. <clears throat> and mugs, I've gotten really into mugs. I used to not, I used to not make very many mugs and I just thought, well, I'm just gonna price them if people want them and they're cheaper than they were than they are now, but they, they, they weren't decorated. Um, but I just thought, well, if people really want them, then they'll, they'll pay, them, pay such and such for them. But now I really love making those. And uh, yeah, so what is the uh, what was the last workshop that you ever attended, or that you attended any workshops? I went to um, Ashboro. I went to Ashboro, and I went to and I went to, and uh, I saw. Peter B. Seeker and Julie Galloway and Tara Wilson make work for two and a half or two days. Yeah, pretty much just two days. Not familiar with Tara Wilson, but not the other two. Pete B. Seeker, he he makes um, he makes these like really large forms, like double wall thick forms, mm -hmm. and then these cups that go inside of that form, maybe like a handle across, and there's like this real precision to his work and Julia Galloway. Yeah, that doesn't Soda fires at Cone Six. You've you've probably seen her work. She <coughs> yeah. like tall narrow bases. Like a lot of underglaze. Yeah, like a lot of decoration, like sections of decoration. Tara and, does wood firing. And Tara does wood firing, yeah. And um, it was pretty good. I I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed I saw a lot of old friends. A woman who was going and came back to Guilford as an adult student and was going to do a BFA and and um, and spent a couple of years at Guilford and her husband got transferred or her husband was in the was in the uh, furniture industry and lost his job and then got another job out in California and then they had an option to go to China so they went to China. But she came down, she's back in Wisconsin now, a couple of years ago. And it was just good to catch up with her and, and see some other friends I hadn't seen in a while in the clay world. And it used to be I'd go to something like that and I would just, wouldn't know hardly anybody. And now I feel like I know a lot of people, so it's more fun, it's more social. So did you do one of these two pots, your first workshop? Here? No, like, well, not here, but this is your first workshop. Would I do this in front of a bunch of people? No, like, when you, when you did your first workshop, you uh, know, I probably, yeah, I probably did. I'm trying to think. I have to, um, the handles of them are made with uh, extruded. Do you guys have an extruder? Yeah. It's what kind of it? We have North Star, we have, actually we have the two different size barrels for the bailage. Okay, and you've got that in here too? Well, or? we can put it together, the barrels aren't, aren't up on the bed. Okay, I can also just extrude it at home and bring it in. It might be easier than you put it together. I'll bring the die in and show you guys. <coughs> Alright, so I put that little line in there. That remnant. And then I usually will go around and mark, kind of thinking about where I'm going to stick, where I'm going to push out against this. Is it really, is we're ready to do that? Come on, let me play this a little bit more. I need to kill some time right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too fast. I'm going to lower this down a little bit. Yeah, that'll be better. I'm thinking about, as I drag this tool through it, having that tool show. And if I don't, if I don't drag that down enough, push that down enough, then it's not going to show really well. I'll lower this a little bit too. The trouble is that one that I photographed, and I've got images of. It's like I've got images of it when it's done, but it changes so much that I can't remember how I threw it. <laughs> John started it.
So these will be spots at which I drag my tool, start dragging my tool up and around. You want three? Three spots. And they're not quite even. This will be the front, and this will be the back. So just put like a little bit of a little bit of motion into that, and then uh, look at that. My lip pretty much stayed right exactly where I was supposed to. Yay. All right, then I'll just throw a spout for this and a lid. And we'll break for lunch. Yeah, it's good that I'm making this because I do stuff to this pot that I don't do to anything else. Treat it nice and that I don't do to any other teapots. What's the farthest south you've been in Georgia? Well, I've driven all the way to Florida. Mm -hmm. So you're familiar with that Austin State University? Where? I've, I've heard of it. Is that for you in school there? Did you like being in Georgia? Uh, I like I like the school. <laughs> so this on this one I measured that inside and I'm just gonna have the lid overhang the edge. I've done this a couple different ways. I've had a lid that sat down in. My student who graduated last year, Tara Wright, made a teapot. The brilliant solution to that, that spot where the handle and the lid meet. And she threw, like, made a really deep flange and then cut up into the handle so that the handle goes over the top and like flows right into the body. Wow. It's going to be on our card. I have to send out for this show. She didn't have any good current photos. So when I'm making this lid, I'll leave a lot of clay out here, and I'm going to lay this down at an angle here, maybe 45 degrees, maybe a little bit, a little bit less, and then I'll split that. Give myself space for. Uh, Give myself some clay for this vertical part of my flange here. And this is a teapot that, um, because it's got the handle over the top, I don't expect that people are going to be pouring it without having like a hand near the lid, so I don't worry so much about the lid falling out of this one. And just the way it's set up, it's just not, it's not easy, easy fallout. But I've got to make sure there's enough space out here to cover my lip. Oh, so that, does that one hang over? It's top? going to hang on. Yeah, if you look at the ones over there, there's a section of it that's on top of the lip. Uh, yeah. Have you guys ever used a string like this to cut off? No. If you throw off the hump, it's much easier to get a consistent flow. Now, is that string braided at all, or is it just... It is. Smooth? It's like woven. I found the ones that are, you know, slightly braided. Uh, actually, we use, I use the, uh, the string off our canvases quite a bit. <laughs> off yeah. what? So you're the, the canvas. <laughs> so sometimes you just have to cut a little slice. <laughs> I used dental floss for a little while when I, before I found this. And um, but if it's flat dental floss, it like moves and shifts as it goes through. Yeah. I've got one that's a silk that that's done. So I just lay it in there, and then it comes around, crosses over, and I pull it through. For some reason, I guess I got to this this like cutting off bit thing, this technique 
pretty far into my ceramics career here. Well, my students that go just have a hard time grasping, grasping how they do that. See, they got the wheel going around too fast, and the string gets caught, and all of a sudden they're like slicing through <laughs> everything. <else. laughs> or they don't hold it level, and so it's like going up yeah, as they come around and they pull it like off. <laughs> can't quite seem to get it, and and for for a while, I just thought. Really, you can't. And then I thought, well, I guess I really was. This wasn't my first year making pots that I learned to do this. It was really, after my like twentieth year. <laughs> <laughs> so this spout's a little bit different. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make like a pouch down here. So the other. Another thing as I'm doing this, do you guys ever have trouble making a spout and getting this clay to go in and not having it wear? And, and having it ruffle on you? I leave this pretty thick until the end. And then once I've gotten all the clay kind of where I want it to be, then I can go in and thin that out. When I was at Guilford, when I was first back in 2000, Terry Hammond, who, uh, who runs the gallery, said, hey, do you want to curate a show for the gallery? And so I, I did. It was called Historical Perspectives on Contemporary Pots. Fancy name for just inviting some <coughs> potters whose pots I really liked and wanted to find out what, what sort of historical stuff they looked at. And one of those was Michael Simon, and uh, and another was um, Malcolm Davis, and I can't remember. Oh, Ellen Shankin. So Ellen Shankin had a teapot in that show, and uh, it had a pretty phallic-looking spout on it. And then if you look looked closely, she like pushed out these two spots <laughs> down in the bottom of the spout. So, so it, was, it was really subtle and pretty humorous.
So I have, um, the first time I did this, I actually, I, I extruded one of these and I pulled the handle for one of these teapots. Um, but that left me with like a pre pretty fragile handle. It's fairly thin and fragile. And it was tough to deal with this, to, flat, to get this, to pull this and not just beat this thing up, as you can imagine. So, um, so I saw Stephen Hill rolled his and I thought, well, that sounds smart. So I've got a little template out here of like how, about how much I need to roll or about how big it needs to be, where, the, where I shouldn't roll and where I should. And so I'll just, I just push this out. So it'll flare a little bit and I'll lengthen this down. And I'm not gonna roll to the end and I don't wanna use the end. I want more clay down there than I need for my handle. And so you can see my line right there. That's about where I'll cut it. And the reason I want this extra clay down there and I won't cut it before I put it on is this is going to dry first. And up here is going to be this fresh, nice clay. So I'll wait till it stiffens up a little bit and then I'll cut it and then it'll be a pretty good consistency. <laughs> well, Linda, what have you got? You want me to decorate one of those? Sure. <laughs> Put a fox on it. Yeah. <laughs> Linda was telling me yesterday about the foxes. The foxes in her neighborhood chasing the rabbits, having, having uh, a litter of kits or whatever the foxes have. Chased one of the cats back yeah. to the house. Yeah, they're not very big. Did you did you guys hear about that fox that was in Greensboro that that, that attacked that guy when he was out for a walk? It was somewhere in Greensboro. It was probably a year and a half ago or two years ago in the spring, I think. And uh, this guy said he was out on a walk and this fox just came out of nowhere and just bit his leg and kind of like kicked it off and it kept coming back and then his dog got entangled with it. And, uh, and he said at some point, he's like, I, the, it just wouldn't leave. So I had to just grab it by the neck and like take it back and he put it in this trash can that was still alive. And he put something on his trash can and called animal control. And as you can imagine, it had rabies. Oh, and, um, and so, um, so then, then a, a few months later, or maybe it was, yeah, about a half a year later, I'm, I'm uh, putting this up on here so that it, it's fairly level, so that it doesn't bend funny. So about a half a year later, I drew my first fox on a pot. And I like foxes. I've liked foxes for a long time. I, I, uh, I used to see them around the area where I live, where I grew up in Greensboro. I mean, sorry, in Columbia, Maryland. I, I had some friends who lived out in the country. When I'd drive to their house and drive home, I'd see them at night a lot. And, um, but a year and a half ago, I saw the first one in our neighborhood and, uh, it was up at the top of our road, this little cul-de-sac and it was sitting by the edge of the road and it had a lace chip bag and it was completely stuck over its head. It was like down to its shoulders. It was one of those small chip bags. It was probably a juvenile fox. And, uh, at first as I was pulling, I was, I was getting ready to pull out and one of my neighbors was like stopped in front of me and I thought, what is he waiting for? There's plenty of time. And he kind of pulls out and back in and as I pull up, I look over and I see it. And I thought it was a groundhog at first because it was sitting down. So I pulled back in and we got out and we're looking at it. And, and he was like, what do you, what do you think? What do you, what do you think it is? And it stood up and I was like, whoa, it's a fox. It's a long, long tail. 
and it just kind of paced around and sat back down and it was very calm and he was like well what are we going to do what should we do with it and I walked over near it and as I was, I was being very cautious and as I got near it like I scuffed my foot on the ground and it kind of like turned its head a little bit and I jumped back <laughs> and I thought I'll wait I'll wait for some cars so some cars drove by and as the last one drove by I, I snuck over there and I pulled the chip bag off of its head and jumped back ready for it to attack me and it shot across the road and looked back and ran a little bit further and looked back and ran a little bit further and looked back and that was like three days after I'd like put put the first fox on a pot and I thought this is meant it was meant to be it's like it, this encounter so I stick I stick this little uh, this lid right in the center here and it's a way for me to kind of judge how round this this handle is in the top so I stick it down there and I kind of just space it around and I'll let this sit and dry for a little while and uh, oh, I usually mark I didn't do that I usually mark like with these, these lines I usually put a mark in here so I know I better do that and that'll let me know how um, where I need to cut to make it even and I feel like every time I do it it's never I, it, it's never quite even I'm always when I as I put it on and I'm moving it on the pot you'll see where's my where's my knife oh, here I can use this as I put it on the pot and I'm like moving it around you'll see it always looks like a little bit off but this will give me a straight line to cut against and give me an idea of how much I can cut off. It's usually not this long, but it's better to have more than less. So then I'm going to bend this. So did that man have to have those painful stomach shots? Oh, I bet. Yeah. Really? What happened to him? Did he get attacked by a fox? No, he had a stray dog in the neighborhood that, uh, that bit him. So here's the teapot. I stuck my lid in here upside down yesterday and it got a little bit of gunk on it. Oh, here's another thing. I didn't do this yesterday before I cut it off. Do it now. Kind of mark those those places with my finger. So when I first started doing this, I was paddling this edge, and um, and that worked pretty good. But then I found if I used a roller on this. I could, it, would, it was a, even better. So I'm kind of rolling this up and out. And I'm thinking about this, the foot that's going to go right here. So I don't want that area to be too slanted. But as I push, as I push this out, as I come around and push this out, it's, um, flexing that clay and sort of stretching it out further away from the pot, which makes that edge a little bit more dynamic. And I'm giving support underneath because if I'm not, I'll crush the pot in the shoulder. Let's flip it over and look at it. See if I've applied enough. Yeah. So long as it lifts, it lifts it 
Yeah, so long as it lifts it up. Simple hide and low. People often see this teapot and they say, well, how much tea can I actually get into there? And you think about this is like a really wide, wide teapot. You can get quite a bit. For how for how small it can seem. All right, and then this morning at home, I extruded out a piece for my handle and for my feet. This is the first die I ever made for an extruder. It um, it's two big holes, two small holes, and I drilled. I was mean, I meant to bring the die, but I forgot to bring it. And I drilled it in a piece of aluminum, which wasn't the best thing to use, but it worked fine. And then I mounted it to a piece of wood. So it's, it was a very small little piece of metal. But the aluminum works good because it doesn't shift or move at all. It's thick enough that it holds up. But no, I, I got this red, this some plastic. Uh, back before they were recycling small pieces of plastic, and I just went someplace in Greensboro. I can't, it was before I really knew Greensboro that well, so I'd, I can't even tell you where it was. And um, someone had told me Lexan, but Lexan's like a plexiglass, and it's a little bit too rigid, and so it cracks. So what you want is a fairly thick plastic that has some flex to it so that when it gets pressure, under pressure, it can give a little bit and not crack. So now I cut it, I usually cut them out of something like that and I use a Dremel. And, uh, and then you can use like a little torch to soften the edges up, like after you, if you've like sanded it, whatever, and it's got, it's just rough, then you can soften it up with some heat. So I'm, can you guys see this? I'm cutting this piece in half. Makes for a good, a good foot. Gives me something to attach here. So I curve that along there. Everything's really sticky, I'm wanting to stay together, but I'll scratch it anyways, just to make sure. This is like the one thing, these will sometimes come off, and when they come off, it's, it's in the high firing, it's never in the bisque. That one, the edge will peel up a little bit, probably because the, the teapot gets caught on the shelf, and as it sort of starts to shrink, it'll rip the foot back slightly. So one way that I try to get around that is I'll put some grog or some sand on the shelf just under the feet. I'll also add alumina hydrate to my wax. Does anybody ever do that? Does anybody know that trick? So if you're working with porcelain, sometimes the porcelain can flux a little bit and things can stick together, like lids can stick to the pots. So you put a little bit of alumina hydrate in your wax and when you wax your pots at alumina hydrate, uh, when the wax burns away, that there's this like little fine dusting of alumina hydrate, and that um, that'll allow you to get lids off easier if you have trouble with your lids. And I put that on the feet of my pots so they can slide on the shelf. When I was first out, I was telling you guys yesterday that a woman, Kathy Adams in Georgia, had let me use her kiln, and um, at one point I. I was having problems with like parts of my feet sticking to the shelf and uh, I'd like lose like a little chunk of my foot. And I couldn't figure out why I didn't know enough stuff about materials and glazes and stuff. She used a lot of chinos and there's probably, the chinos were probably putting out a little bit of soda ash onto the shelves and she was just using a silica and a, and a like a silica EPK kiln wash. And, um, and the kiln wash was fluxing a little bit over time. And so things were starting to stick to it slightly. At some point I figured it out. I don't know how, but
but I figured it out when I was at Guilford and I started making kiln watch out of alumina hydrate and EPK. Some of, half the EPK was calcined, bisque fired, and half of it was just right out of the bucket. But that's been great. I haven't had any problems with that. And it's without having that silicon to kiln wash, it doesn't, over time, it doesn't start to have pots stick to it. It's, it's in the uh, EPK, so it's like 50% alumina hydrate, 25% EPK that's been bisque fired, and 25% EPK that hasn't been bisque fired. I just like put a bowl of it in the bisque firing. And what that does is to the EPK is it shrinks the EPK, so your kiln wash is less likely to crack and come off after you've painted it on, fired it. Just a different combination of material, yeah. Do you guys ever have problems with kiln wash? Hate kiln wash. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah, but that's, it's a build up. You know, you're trying to save the shells back there and it has to be repeated. You know? Yeah. I, I, um, when I was first back at Guilford teaching, I took the shelves. I, I had to find, I went all over Greensboro trying to find a place that would sandblast them. And I eventually found a place. People that use sand wouldn't do it. I think they thought it would wreck the shelf. But I found somebody that uses like beads to sandblast. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what. It was like Ellis. What's that? I I. Well, I so I no i just had them done that one time i had them i had them sandblasted and it took everything off all the glass all the glaze that had melted onto them and and got them to be level again and then and now with this with this kiln wash i'm really i check pots i make sure pots don't go in that look like they're going to run onto the kiln shelf and uh and so when they do it's not usually not that bad and um and we yeah we just Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, and it'll it'll wreck the shelves. Yeah, and um, and. I used to, yeah, I put my glaze on so lightly now that I hardly ever have it touch the shelf. Um, but sometimes a student, they, they're either working at a size that they're not used to working at or, or something else happens. One, so one, a couple years ago, I had a student who had dipped, she had made these hand-built vases that were kind of square or boxy, and she had dipped it one in um, a chino glaze and then decided at some point she didn't want that and she washed it off and it was a chino that had a lot of uh, soda ash in it and i had heard malcolm davis had said this in his workshop that if you glaze something with a chino glaze like things won't stick to it after that and but i hadn't actually seen it happen but then she glazed it in um she glazed in a timoku after that and it was a little bit heavy but just sheets of this glaze just fell off in the firing. Like, I mean, just, it wasn't like it, it dripped and ran. It was like a big chunk fell off. I had a teapot nearby and it, and it fell like into the lid. And so it just like sealed the lid. I, I felt like though that's the cost of firing my stuff at Guilford is that I wasn't even mad. It was like, yeah, that's just gonna happen sometimes because I'm firing my stuff with students work occasionally. Oh yeah, ant or antique green yeah. in the wood kiln. He yeah, there was like a little container, so he was putting it on a little bit heavy, yeah. and then uh, <laughs> trying to dip it in that little container. And then yeah, on top of that, the wood kiln. It was probably in the hottest part of the wood kiln. It was probably like like eleven, eleven and a half there, and it just. 
it, yeah, it just ran. And I knew it was going to run, so I told him to wipe it off. He had, these, he had these mugs that were sort of shaped like that teapot. And I said, well, wipe it off everything under the vertical side. And he did, but it's still, like, streams of it just came down. And that's not such a big deal. I don't know if you guys have wood-fired before, but there's so much junk that gets on the shelves. It's not even, and things are up on wads. It's like you can't, glaze isn't going to really do too much if it runs onto the shelf in that kiln or in our soda kiln. It's mostly just the gas kiln. No wadding. <laughs> but if I have, you, you know, you could mix some wadding. If you had stuff that you thought could, was going to run a lot, you put it up on some wads and typically it'll save the shelves. All right, I'm going to about to do the best, the best part of this whole demonstration. So if you're sleeping in the back row, it's a good time to wake up. <laughs> so I've smoothed all my feet in. Got this out here. All right, you ready? So I blow, I blow into that, and what that does is it gives me it makes that base slump down there. So it doesn't look like, you know, I, I, by the time I get those feet onto there, I have clay all over my face too. <laughs> by the time I get those feet on there, it's looking like a little bit flat, maybe even concaved. And by going back in and blowing it, I've probably added like another cup of tea to that. So I talked about the, having a front and a back to this pot. And I, and I really love the way that this line comes up and that this line here comes back, although that one could use a little bit of lift to it. Let's see here. This is one of the better ones I've actually made this year. Maybe the only one I've made this year. So I, I like that, and so I want, I want to think about it when I photograph this, if I want to have the spout, and a little bit of the opening of the spout, how that's going to be turned, and how that spout is going to be going this way, and this is going to be going that back that way. Um, and so like the visual elements of the of the pot are important. Okay, I'm going to ask you another question. I think I missed a step. The lines that are inside of the pot, did you go inside and make those? The, these, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I did that yesterday, yeah. When it was still wet on the wheel, I dragged this one of these tools up the inside as it slowly okay. turned. So I've got to put the spout on and I've got to make the handle. So let's go ahead. I'll put the spout on and then I'll roll the handle out and we'll let it, let it dry for a little while. I made an extra spout yesterday, so I've got two to choose from. And uh, let's see. Put it down here. Well, that, this one is right here. That's, a, that's, that's the other spout that was a little bit short. So when I'm, measuring, when I'm, when I'm deciding how to, how to put a spout on here, cut a spout, this is, this is about the height that I want my spout to be. Maybe, brand, maybe this hole being right over the center of that line or a little bit lower, but not too much lower because if I fill this with tea, or I fill this with hot water, I don't want to pouring out my spout before it gets to the top. And if it's too high up, I, I made this mistake in college where I was like, well, how come nobody has this really high spout? And so I made this teapot with a really high spout, and then I went to pour out of it, and it came out of the lid before it like, got to the top of the spout. <laughs> so if you want a really high spout, you've got to have your lid back here and your spout up here and a lot of distance between those, those two things. But this... Bend this a little bit further. I'm going to think about like how that's going to go on and where it's going to go on. I don't really want it down at the bottom of the pot, and I don't want it right up next to the lip. I want it somewhere in the middle. And how much am I going to have to cut away? And what angle is it going to go up at? All right, so I think I've decided. It's less than I thought I would cut off of it, but this is a. This is much more of a 45 degree angle than pretty much any teapot I put a spout on. You know, typically they're almost a vertical wall or something close to that. 
And the same thing goes for this. So I'm going to go across, I'm going to cut this, I'm going to kind of scoop instead of going straight across. I'm going to come right down to that front, the lowest point. Oh. Flare that clay. So it could, because I have a handle over the top as well, I also want to think about the relationship that I'm going to have between the handle, the, how the spout's coming off, and how the handle's coming off. So where is this spot going to be? Probably right about. I can look back across the lid and make sure it's high enough. And that looks pretty good. I used to, I used to be really concerned about the spout and having this like little bulge over here and the spout. I don't know, I used to cut it funky to kind of fit the pot and then I just stopped doing that. I thought I can just put it on there. It'll be fine. So you guys got to see me do this yesterday, make all my little holes. I think I thought I was going to have to retire this, but. So do you have a higher priority of where you put the spout versus the handle? Um, it's not so much a higher priority, but it is. I've got to think about both of them. Because I don't want to, I don't want to put the spout on and look at my pot and go, wow, where am I going to put a handle on this? Or how am I going to get a handle on here? Or, or where I thought the handle was going to go is not going to work anymore because it's going to look funny against this spout. Um, I need, I, I guess I need both of them to perform certain, certain tasks. And so I have to think about the way that they're best, both best going to perform those tasks within this, within what I've got to work with. And I might, I'll push this one in a little bit. I don't want to sink, sink the side in too much because I'll alter the pot more than that other one I did yesterday. That's probably close to enough. Get a couple more in here. And I, when I'm cutting these holes, I always start with the tool facing away from the other holes. I always start that first initial cut and then I can push it in as far as I feel like I need to and turn it. Push this in a little bit. And this, this edge here, I'm going to try to take away a little bit of that inner edge to come out more flat. look across my spout again make sure make sure before I commit to this that it's going the right direction now this one this is I work on this pot a little bit wetter than I might work on some of the others um, just because in order to add those feet and to blow the bottom and have it puff out and uh, and get this spout across this large area. All right, I'll come back up and touch up that outside. That's sort of that's the way it looks. Think about that from that side. 
So like looking at this, I might want my spout to come up a little bit more before it bends over. We'll see when I get the handle on there, I might make some adjustments to the spout again. I'm, I'm thinking of in terms of aesthetics of that, this handle coming up and off of there and how that, what that negative space looks like between these two things. This sort of parting this way, this parting this way. Yeah, it looks like it's, and I like it's a little bit longer than maybe I've made them in the past, but it looks like it's really moving forward. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to, I'm going to just touch up this little line right here. Make sure that doesn't, that doesn't come back and crack on me later. I might have you guys vote on what you want to see me finish. Just what's high priority. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to decorate because it sounds like that. We were talking at lunch about how decorating is oftentimes left to last or it's like the thing that's not glazing. You know, it's like, all right, you just dunk it in this bucket and that's all you do. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably make some changes to my class at Guilford and, and start spending a little bit more time on decorating and uh, glazing. And I did that some this semester. I took a poll near mid-semester and I asked students how they felt about that dropping a project and having some days where we just come in and glaze as a class and they they thought that was a good idea so and it turned out good I think there's students are doing stuff that I showed them um, that I don't think they would do otherwise that are just going to make for better finished results more exciting for me more exciting for them But that's the hard thing, and it's, I think a lot of programs are probably like that, where the emphasis is not on glazing or, de you know, or like finishing, but on the throwing. And it's such that, you know, the throwing is such a hard thing to grasp from the start that you probably should have a lot of emphasis on that. So that's, that might be a little tall. Take, take some more off. Is it going to sit on that, on that edge? It's going to sit on that edge. Seems like kind of a bad idea, doesn't it, Brooks? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. You ever feel like you've painted yourself into a corner? And, and then you're there, and you're like, oh, maybe that wasn't. For for what set? Sorry, I didn't get the. From start to finish on a teapot time frame. Oh, um, I you know I can I can make, you know the throwing them is pretty quick. I could do like throw all the parts as part of something I do over a day, and then I could put together three of these in a couple hours. So you're at your you're about what eight ten hours. Yeah. Well, for. I guess maybe by the time it's all done, maybe by the time it's like out of the kiln and I've glazed it and everything, it could be up there. It doesn't feel like it's that, that many hours. Uh, I never, I'm usually pulled in so many different directions in the studio. I'm working on so many different things that I don't get to like just sit down and do one thing. Um, so it's hard to say. Is there a Lazy Susan by any chance? Let me, But certainly this, this is a, a pretty, can be a pretty time consuming pot to put together. So when I was, when I was first out of school, let's put it down right here. How heavy is it? It's pretty heavy. It's going to flip this board, it's a teapot on my head. <laughs> and the next trick. <laughs> so when I was, um, I was in Atlanta, I was out, of, out and in my, the studio up in Roswell, and it was probably one of my first best firings. 
and I had made one of these pots, and I hadn't made that many of them. So at that time, it did take me a long time. I mean, I'd, I'd spend a lot of time putting it together. And, um, and I go downstairs. I had to go downstairs with all my pots to bisque fire them. And I get down there, and I thought, huh, I wonder if I wiped my signature off the bottom of this. You know, like, I've signed it, and the bur clay burls up a little bit. I wonder if I wiped that off. Flipped it over, the lid fell out, hit the, hit the handle, <laughs> broke the handle in half. That was another one of those times where I was like, am I really doing this for a living? Because I seem, I seem pretty unskilled at it at this point, breaking my own products. My, my survival rate, though, for pots um, in, the, in the gas firing, like things that I get out that I feel like are sellable, is pretty high at this point. I, I rarely get work out that I feel like is messed up in some way. I'm just trying to find out what's going to be my center. No, they're all gas fired and with the wood ash glaze sprayed on them. And that's, that's some of the, um, that's probably some of the reason that my success is pretty high. It's, the gas firing is, uh, let's see, I'm going to mark the center line back here and mark the center up here. Put a little bit of that on. I've done this so many different ways of putting this on. They, it always goes on pretty much the same way, but sometimes I've left like a little flap on the back that covers this area. I didn't do that this time. Honestly, I kind of forgot that I used to do that. Sometimes I see old pots and I'm like, oh, I didn't know I knew how to do that. <laughs> forgot. This is kind of a touchy area. If, if it looks like it's about to fall over, yell, because... <sighs> That occasionally happens, I'm like moving this around and getting it into place. It is, yeah. <coughs> I don't know if a sculptor would look at my pots and think they're really sculptural, but I certainly feel like I'm making like Sometimes I'm making like a functional sculpture. How do you feel about the blurry line between sculpture and For me, um, there's, I talk to students about making decisions um, if it's going to be a sculptural piece, then it's, it has to address maybe some visual stuff differently than if it's a functional piece, or at least, I don't know if that's necessarily that true though, whether it, if, if, so if I had my spout coming out the bottom here, so that as soon as you poured water in it, like water ran out, right? And, just be this sort of like ironic teapot that like water, <laughs> like you can never really use. And, uh, and, if, and if I did that, then I'd certainly, there's, there has to be something there other than just its function and its teapot, you know, there's, because it's really not about a teapot anymore, it's about this other thing, this like, this, this water running out, this sort of irony of, uh, of it being a teapot. And, and so, so if, when we're making teapots and students put their spout too low and say, well, you can fill the teapot up halfway. Well, it doesn't really, it's not really like talking about this sort of irony of putting liquid in and having it pour out. It's just a poorly made functional teapot at that point, which then I guess is sculpture, right? Because it, does, it doesn't function as it's supposed to. So it's like a non-functional piece of clay, um, which would be sculpture, I guess. <laughs> is that the, the definition? Um, 
but it seems that the, the world of clay is embracing, is embracing things that it hasn't for a long time. You know, there's, I feel a little bit guilty that when I decorate and I'll do this on one of my pots, some stuff I just hand draw the whole thing. I don't, the image just comes right out of my head. I just draw it on there. I've seen an image of something and I'm, I'm like recreating it on the pot. And then there's some that I have like a stencil and maybe I've drawn it. I'm the original artist of that stencil and I've drawn it on something. And I was like, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good Fox. It's going to be tough for me to like recreate a better Fox. And so I'll use that a template to then put a Fox on. I'll have different sizes of it for different size pots. And it just sort of streamlines that process. Um, but it feels kind of like it's cheating to me because I'm like taking it from this stencil as opposed to like drawing it freehand every single time, which when you have like 50 pots in front of you is daunting. So, um, or it just takes too long. I can't, I can't make functional pots at a price that people are gonna readily pay and, and hand draw each one from scratch. I'm not good enough drawer for that every time. So I use a stencil and it kind of feels like cheating, but then you look out there and it's like, well, people are like appropriating images from anywhere, putting them on a de decal paper and putting them on their pots. And uh, it's like, well, how does, how do I, you know, they don't feel bad about it. Why should I really feel bad that I'm, that I'm getting my images, like how I'm getting my images on the pots if they're my images? Or even if they're not, maybe like, I'm not the source for them, but you know, by the time I'm done with them, they're different than what I've found out there. They're... You're not using, are you using a, a mixture of like different colors and stuff? It's all brush. It's all hand done, it's all hand done yeah. Okay. And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe at some point, I'll have a line, I'll do some that are just decals. I don't know enough about decals to do decals, and I don't know how it w would work with my glaze or if it would work with my glaze. Yeah, from, from, a, from, a, from an artistic standpoint, I think so. From a, from a business standpoint, maybe not. Somebody once, somebody I knew once asked me, I didn't know him that well, he didn't know my work. He did, he'd never seen my work or anything. So a friend through Ultimate Frisbee, but he said, it's like, why don't you just, why don't you just make like a different line of work also that, that's, you know, easier, or, you know, it's like not as time consuming to make. And uh, I was like, yeah, I could do that. But then I'm making that work. I'm not making this work. If, you know, I don't, there's no substitute for me making the work. I can't, I don't really want to hand it off to somebody else. Um, and if I'm making that work, if I'm making something, I'm making it. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's a high quality or low quality, it's still, I got to spend the time on it. I think clay has maybe gone out of favor in some ways that, you know, Garth Clark visited North Carolina recently. Did anybody go to any of his talks? Yeah. yeah. And certainly, you know, he was talking about craft being dead. And um, I was talking to Matt Jones about it. Matt Jones is like, well, it's certainly the way that he was selling craft is, is dead, but that's such a limited view of craft and certainly different than it is in North Carolina. So, but, but yet, like you think about that, you think about that, uh, that, that phrase craft is dead and even it's dead in every place but North Carolina and I would say in some ways it's like the craft movement's coming back, you know, you like go on to these sites where people are doing things that, you know, like making handmade stuff that has been out of vogue for so long and that young people are getting back into it. And it, it's, made, it's different than what he, he's talking about, like a different level of craft, I think. So that's pretty much the handle. I, I added that clay in on the sides and I blended in. And then the lid's going to fit over and it's going to, the rim's going to hang over and I've got to cut the lid to fit around the handle. And um, you can look at that as like an opportunity or a pain in the butt, just depending on <laughs> your perspective.